A reading from the Gospel according to John. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathan, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes for he was naked and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, Follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. He was the one who had reclined next to Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? Jesus said to him, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Follow me. So the rumor spread in the community that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and has written them. And we know that his testimony is true. But there were also many other things that Jesus did. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. This This is is the the word word of the the Lord. Lord. (laughs) 
You know what it's like when you haven't seen someone for a really long time? Or even maybe a short time, but a time that's been packed with so much experience or change or growth that it feels as if an entire lifetime has come and gone. You know that feeling of wanting to reach into that person's soul and just open it up and hear all the words you want to hear, but to know that you need to go slowly, that in time they will unpack those experiences for you just like they unpacked their luggage. And you just have to trust there is time. We will get to it all. Do you know that feeling? This morning we come to the end of our travels in the Gospel of John. And we find the friends and followers of Jesus have returned home following the astounding and heartbreaking and terrifying and surreal events of Holy Week. That week in which they saw Jesus soar to the peaks of popularity and crash to the depths of humiliation and even death and somehow rise again. And it has all been too much. They're home now. They've gone back to Galilee. And they're trying to find some normalcy by returning to their old occupations and resuming their old habits. Do you know that feeling of just wanting to feel normal again? So naturally, they have gone fishing. And into their attempt at normalcy comes Jesus, though Just as when he showed up on Easter mornings, folks are having some trouble recognizing him at first. But once he points them to an enormous catch of fish, followed by a nice grilled fish and bread breakfast on the beach, they know something's up. And they want to ask him things, mostly, who are you? But they don't, because they do know who he is, And it is a week or so after Jesus was crucified and died and buried and then somehow rose again from the dead. And what they really want to do is reach into his soul and open it up and hear all the words they want to hear. They want Jesus to fill the enormous gaps in their understanding, to help them make sense of it all. They want to ask him all sorts of things. What would you ask? I mean it, what would you ask? If there you were with Jesus a couple of weeks later, what would you ask him? That's a great question. What now? Anybody? How long can you stay? Isn't that the question we always ask the people we love when they come home? How long can you stay? Anything else? How? How did this happen? How is this possible? Why did this happen? What does this mean? Were you really dead? What's it like being dead? What did you see? Where did you go? Did you see God? Are you God? Who are you? But they don't ask. Maybe they are overwhelmed by the sheer number of questions they are dying to ask Jesus. Maybe they are a little afraid of Jesus now. Maybe they trust that there will be plenty of time to unpack all of this. All of these stories in the days, months, and years to come. Maybe 
Maybe they're right about that. But then as they're gathered around a charcoal fire, it's Jesus who asks a question. He asks three questions, but really one question. Simon, son of John, do you love me? It seems like a very long time ago, but do you remember the last time Simon Peter was huddled around a charcoal fire? And one question was lobbed at him three times, always boiling down to, hey, you, don't you know that Jesus guy? And now, following a hard night of fishing, but fresh from a swim, and having been fortified by a good breakfast, it's as if Peter is given an opportunity to unsay the things he said and to undo the things he did by answering three times, not, I don't know him, but, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. To which Jesus responds, feed my sheep. So much to say, so many questions to ask. So much to catch up on, so much to learn and relearn in the light of this new and almost unimaginable reality. And it can't possibly all be captured, even in this last chapter of this extraordinary and strange and beautiful gospel. Try to tell the story of your once-in-a-lifetime experience in just a few minutes. Try to tell the story of life and death and life again. Try to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. You can and you can't. If all the details were written down, I suspect the world itself could not contain all the books that would be written. But there remains a deep longing in Jesus' friends, in all Jesus' friends, and maybe in Jesus, too, to fill in the gaps. And the way Jesus deals with that is Come to breakfast and feed my sheep. The final gift Jesus leaves his people is the gift of the shared meal. They step off that boat after a hard night of fishing, and he invites them to take their fill, yes, of the gifts they themselves have brought to the table, prepared lovingly by him. And in the light of their love and devotion to him, he invites them to invite others to share the meal as well. Experience fills in the gaps where the words fail. If a picture is worth a thousand words, a tangible, human, bodily experience like a shared meal is worth infinitely more. Jesus invites us to the meal. He invites us to come from our days of work and play and rest, from our nights of sorrow or joy or confusion. He invites us to bring our questions. Who are you? Am I doing the right thing? How do you want me to love? How can I be the person you want me to be? Will you be with me? He invites us to bring the offerings of our lives and to sit with him at the table. He wants to fill in the gaps for us, not just like the hobbits filling in the corners, but the gaps in our hearts as well as our stomachs. He wants to answer our questions and question our answers. He wants us to add our own chapters to the story, God's story and our story written together. 
at the end of the story is an invitation to make it our beginning. Jesus invites us to the meal. Come, he says. Come and eat. Thanks be to God. Amen.